Hi, I'm Reed. This is Crowland Publishing. Welcome back to our discussion about how to adapt fantasy subgenres for D&D. And today we're talking about swashbuckling. You know what swashbuckling is. Against the backdrop of political turbulence and war, adventurers, rogues, and picaroons engage in high stakes and exciting and dramatic adventure. Swashbuckler fantasy is about men and women of consequence. These are the servants to kings, the agents, pirates, privateers, spies, rogues, gentlemen of daring, merchants who are out to make their own fortunes. Money and politics are the backdrop to all swashbuckling adventures, as is the primacy of exciting, interesting set pieces. Swashbuckling fantasy is the fantasy of cool stuff. Now, because swashbuckling is an aesthetic rather than a genre, it's a little bit hard to really nail down what it is. It's one of those you know it when you see it things. Swashbuckling itself comes from a word or a term used to describe fencing maneuvers. It's got to do with a shield, a buckler. And a swashbuckler was a swaggering bravo, a ruffian, a noisy braggadocio. That's the old definition for it. It is about heroic presences. And we tend to think of heroic as someone who does someone something good but in this particular terminology a hero is someone who's just bigger and larger than life they have cool and exciting bigger and larger than life adventures therefore and that bigger and larger than life is really what you want to as a dm focus on now there's two ways to do a swashbuckling campaign most of the store-bought corporate fantasy worlds will have trade and politics and exploration built in those are all vital forgotten realms pathfinder eberron check 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 easy it's just an aesthetic you just run a swashbuckling style campaign in that world but i think that the more artistically rewarding way to run one of these games is to create either a fantasy world that closely mirrors our own history the fantastic rpg 7c does this or just make an alternative history with magic in easy and it doesn't require a whole lot of world building so what is the historical and cultural context of swashbuckling Essentially, you are looking at 1600 to 1750 is the basic historical and cultural setting of a swashbuckling fantasy. This is the age of sale. Exploration is going wild. Capitalism is really starting up. So huge corporations like the infamous East India Company are getting on their feet. Strange religions are popping up like ranters and strollers and apocalyptics. And of course, Protestantism is really challenging Catholicism, so there's a huge amount of religious dramas going on. The Renaissance has happened. Art and science and humanism is growing. Theatre is in a golden age. Painting is in a golden age. Sculpture is in a golden age. Women's rights are starting to be discussed. So again, you know, there's cultural revolutions going on. And so many wars, which was bad for the people in them. Great for us and our RPGs. <laughs> Monstrous. Anyway, the Thirty Years' War is happening, which is a you know, huge war with the last of the Holy Roman Empire. The Brits are fighting the Spanish. The Brits are fighting the Brits. Sweden's running wild in Europe. Russia's running wild in Europe. The Ottomans are invading Europe. So much is going on. If you have a look at just the 17th century, just the 1600s, it's, there's so much turmoil and change happening in that century. Modernity is coming. And we should say as well, this is also the start of nationalism, the Atlantic slave trade, all that exploration is colonialism, militarism. <sighs> there, is a, there are dark themes that underpin swashbuckling fantasy. And again, you don't have to explore those. This is a fantasy. But you shouldn't be afraid to look at darker themes either. We're going to do a video on that one day, actually. Let's start with DMing. I think the first thing that you're going to want to do is to have a lot going on in your campaign. Swashbuckling, therefore, is often served by sandbox games. That is, games where the players are given a sort of somehow a list of plot points and are allowed to follow them as they like. So you need to provide your players with a few starting points into the game, a few ways for them to be swashbucklers, because, you know, like I said, you can be a pirate swashbuckler, a musketeer swashbuckler, or a criminal swashbuckler. So do they want to serve the queen? Do they want to be musketeers? Do they want to serve their own companies, ply the seas, like some sort of Clive Cussler character, you know, seeing off rivals and fighting threats to their trade routes? 
Do they want to resist invasion? Do they want to be sort of scarlet pimpernels who are dealing with horrible, rebellious scum? Do they want to be charismatic monster hunters like the Brothers Grimm in that film? Do they want to be scoundrels themselves? Do they want to be rogues defying the law, seeing off the sheriff Robin Hood style swashbucklers? So there's some work on your end as a DM, but that's okay. You're a DM. You can do it. You send the big chair for a reason. So you want to encourage player backgrounds to make this easy on yourself. Let those bloody players leech off your creativity, leech back. So <laughs> that's a very healthy attitude for a DM. But let the players work for you, not against you. Ask them to bring rich, worldly characters with lots going on and then follow up on those backgrounds. Very easy. And of course, mission-based campaigns are pretty easy too. You serve the Queen's spy master. You work for the Pirate King. You work for the Rat Catcher, you know, the, the head of the Thieves Guild. And you are planning to maybe rebel against these masters. You are planning to serve them well. You are seeing off traitors. You are seeing off infiltrators. You are doing huge, cool thefts, big set-piece robberies. You are working for the exploration company and going to the weird lost city of gold. And of course, while you are thinking of interesting settings and ideas and modes for the campaign, there is also these sub sub genres that work really well with um, swashbuckling fantasy. I am really attracted to the clock punk aesthetic where clockwork springs and gears take the place that steam does in steampunk aesthetic. It has the abilities and the properties of magic and highly advanced technology that it can't have in our world. So you've got a lot of weird, strange, janky robots, and eerie land-based vehicles and sea-based vehicles and air-based vehicles, and that's all. Mm, looks like a bit of rogue renaissance world of high technology. So what kind of adventures are these guys going to go on? Well, first of all, like I said, politics. Specifically, the politics of where institutions have competing goals. So governments, monarchies, princedoms, churches, companies, militaries, these sorts of things. They have competing goals and they have agents like your PCs to further those goals. You might be looking for foreign spies or for heretics. You might be tracking down an enemy's kingdom's shipyards on their ships. I had a great campaign that went on for ages and ages that was a Warhammer fantasy world set about 200 years in the future of the Warhammer fantasy world. So they were going over to Lustria, which is fantasy South America, filled with monstrous frogs and dark elves and all that sort of stuff. And they were finding ancient ruins and they actually set themselves up quite handsomely by a live animal for eating export business. So that was uh, interesting. Loads and loads of adventure hooks to be found online. It is more about the attitude. You've got to have over-the-top villains. You've got to have outrageous accents. You've got to take some time as a DM to really plan out some cool set pieces. Where is this cool sword fight going to happen? Is it on a boat? Is the boat on fire? Is it in a factory that seems to only produce steam and lava? Is it on a crumbling castle that's about to explode because the lightning is crashing down all around it? Is it over a moat of boiling oil? Are you on a greased pole while this is happening? There are loads and loads of cool, adventurous and swashbuckling films. You should go and check them out and just have a little notebook with you. Just have a movie marathon and note them down. As well, you want to have really big and bold NPCs. A monstrous pirate captain who nails his enemies to his ship. A noble woman of such vanity she let her son die rather than ruin her fine gown. Your personal tailor, a man of consummate calm and unflappability. Your finest ally. The man who knows you more intimately than you could possibly know yourself. The mad cardinal who will convert France to the worship of the devil. The fiend who took the life of your sword mistress laughing as she did so, and you will have your revenge on the laughing, giggling maniac, big panto villains, big over the top with easy to get motivations. I will have my revenge on the musketeers. I will marry the Pope. And if you're a player, you should get in on this action. So let's talk about characters. So there's something I wanted to talk about in world building. But it's useful to discuss here. So two birds with one stone. Swashbuckling. Low magic. It encourages more daring do and dramatic plans than lightning bolts and speaking with the dead. 
you can't get out of trouble in a good swashbuckling campaign by just casting a spell. Now that's fine for some sorts of D&D, but not here. So your DM will probably have some ideas on how to do a spell casting class. But for me, I ask players to multi-class so that no one ever really has access to high level spells that break immersion. If you really want to be a wizard or a warlock or whatever, we can talk about it, but I generally speaking ask for not too much in the way of spell casting classes, but I never like to say no to people. But I do like to say, okay, well, let's talk about it. I also ask if they would like to reskin their spells as clock punk technology. There's a really fun series of books called The Age of Unreason that's set in a world where pre Newtonian physics are real. So you get airships because they float on the ether. You get the craft pistols that shoot lightning. Ben Franklin figures out how to walk on water. It's loads of fun. So you could have a special kind of musket for your fireballs and your lightning bolts and your magic missiles. You could have cool grenades for the grease. You could have special drugs for sleep spells. You could have healing magic. Is a uh, you know galvanic wires that you just attach to people and zzz, I'm awake. I'm awake. And because we've moved out of the medieval period that D and D really does so well to describe, I ask players to make dex-based melee characters. You just don't see knights and samurais in these games and in these movies and in these worlds. It breaks the immersion. It doesn't feel right. But a player might still want to be a really big, strong fighter, you know, a tank in game terms, and it can be useful to have these kinds of characters. Just that's how the game works. So to accommodate those guys, I up the values of something like just wearing a breastplate, and I include what they historically call buff coats, a very early kind of bulletproof jacket, but I make them look cooler. And looking good is important in these campaigns. Acting like gentlemen, like nobility, like aristos is an important part of the genre because you'll be mixing with high society. And so you, these people really judge on appearances. So you'll be spending your money on clothes, haircuts, fine dining. It will, your background will be important. Do you know which spoon to use with what soup is a part of the genre. And spending money on that sort of stuff might be a kind of D&D that your players are not used to. Also important to being a gentleman, and obviously gentlewoman, is fencing. Your school of swordsmanship is very much a part of your identity as a gentleman and gentlewoman. It is an art that you practice it is a kind of club that you belong to with your peers. It is something to be proud of. It is like your martial art. It is like your football club. It is something that is very important to the identity of most swashbuckling characters. So character classes are schools of fencing. A barbarian is just a school of fencing. A monk is just a school of fencing. How you build your fighter represents different schools of fencing. If you choose to reskin magic as alchemy or technology or something like that paladins might belong to a very eccentric school of fencing religion can be important though so you should feel free to make clerics i tend to use the musketeer aramis as quite an interesting example of a religious swashbuckler church knights they're always great I have often used sorcerers and called them fairy blooded. So, you know, they, they are people who were taken away into the lands of fairy and brought back and given powers. That's always great for, for sorcerers. Wizards, of course, you know, astrologers, alchemists, technologists, if you want to do the reskin, warlocks, fantastic evil villains, and sword packed warlocks can make really, really interesting bad guys for parties. Also, firearms, they're a part of the genre for most 3, 2, 1. And for a lot of swashbuckling adventures, firearms are simply just part and parcel. If you don't want to use them, that's fine. If you do, I would tend to find better gun rules than are in the DMG. There's some really, really great fan versions out there for how you might do pistols, arquebuses, cannons, all that sort of stuff. But I think the really important part of a swashbuckling D&D game is that you can't be too hung up on minus three. If you try that, it's too hard for you. You've really got to accept that these are going to be big, bold characters doing big, bold things and use your drama points, use your action points, use your inspirations and let them do cool, interesting stuff. If you don't want to do that as a DM, you're probably not going to run a great swashbuckling campaign. And if you don't want to do that stuff as a player, you're not going to get the most out of the genre. All right. Flourish your cape. 
I'll see you next time.